We're talking auction drafts and contract leagues on Roto-Viz Radio. I'm Dave Cabin, Senior Fantasy Analyst at Rotoviz. This is Rotoviz Radio brought to you by the FFPC. I'm joined by Matthew Friedman, editor in chief of Fantasy Labs, part of the Action Network. He is back for two consecutive episodes, which I think might be the record in the last couple of months. What's going on, Matt? Yeah, two in a row. It's a uh, it's pretty strong effort by me. Uh, but as, as you see, uh, there's not going to be much that I'm going to contribute to this episode, which is exactly the way I like it. So we're in fine form. Yeah. So the reason being, we're talking auction drafts, and I thought that a man of Matt Friedman's ilk might have something to offer, but it turns out you've only been in one auction league in your entire fantasy experience. Yeah. One auction league, and I did it for one year. And it was, and I think it was actually the first year that we did um, for Rotoviz the reality sports league. Uh, wow. And the draft just took so long. And it's, I mean, there were some great people in it. Uh, I believe Sean was in the league. Rich yep. Rebar was in the league. I think Davis Maddock was in the league. But there were like a number of people. This was like early Rotoviz day. And um, the draft took like five hours. I don't know if that's typical of like an auction league or not. No, it's but not. It was just like, it was like, screw this. Like, I, I like life is too short. Like, I don't like being in tons of leagues anyway, just because I don't want to <laughs> devote like, uh, you know, an hour and a half to two hours of being in like a standard redraft league. Uh, best ball is a little bit different, of course. Like, you know, if there's a, like a clock on it, like a running clock, I mean, of course you can have a running clock on, on other formats, but it just kind of tends to go with that. But like at this point, uh, it was like, no, like I, I understand that auction leagues are the um, the highest leverage, like uh, most skill based uh, type of format you can have. Uh, yep. it, it's like kind of like poker in a way, um, but it's just like it, it, it takes too much effort. And I don't want to put that much time in, into something uh, where like the money is going to be tied up with it for, you know, like uh, 18 weeks. Okay, wow, this is um th- this is perplexing to me on a number of levels. One, the fact that you have just assumed that because the RSO and the contract leagues which rightfully so take that long that you've extrapolated that to all auction drafts taking that long. Second, I find it very interesting about the worry about the investment of time into something that you already spend so much time with. I think that's actually the most perplexing <laughs> of the entire thing. I'm a lazy person. <laughs> that's that's something that a lot of people don't know about me, but I'm pretty lazy. So like or or let me let me rephrase that. Like I'm very uh careful with my time. So okay. there are certain things where I feel like it it makes sense to commit time to certain endeavors and then other things where it's like uh I don't I just don't see the value in it. So I don't see the value in like the um like the intellectual thrill or whatever it is that I might get out of playing in an auction league, I don't think would justify the extra time I have to put into it to do the auction relative to a, like, uh, you know, like um, a, a slow draft. You know what I mean? Where I just do it at my okay. convenience. I gotcha. I gotcha. All right. Well, I will say this. In my experience, auction drafts take the same amount of time as your regular redraft league. So anyway, the reason that we're bringing up and discussing this is because I wanted to do an extensive episode on auction drafts because I believe that in many regards, the actual draft for an auction is more fun uh, than your typical redraft. We're going to talk about contract leagues later in the show. That won't take up quite as much of our time as the auction league. Um, But I guess the other thing is there's really not as much coverage on auction leagues as there are for redraft. And there seems to be somewhat of a demand for more content on that. And uh, I think that actually the most popular article that I've had up on Rotoviz centers on auction drafts. So I wanted to take some time to run us through that. I guess, Matt, seeing as you are such a noob at this, are there any questions that maybe somebody that's never done an auction would have right off of the bat that you think I should bring up first? 
uh, well, it's hard for me to get in that mindset because even though I, I don't play auction, I'm such an expert at every, no, I'm joking. Uh, I think one of the, the big questions that, uh, that people have entering auction leagues, uh, yep. is to kind of think about, um, like when you want to nominate players that you want, um, and then like how to kind of stratify the um the salary cap that you have so like what is the the proper salary amount that should be allocated yep. to your wide receiver one versus your wide receiver two and so on yeah so so those are actually all good questions and i think some of these will kind of what my plan was i'm going to kind of talk through some of the key highlights from the articles that i've done on auctions the last couple of years and uh, we'll get down really to the specific of how you're determining the percentage, because I think that you should really be going a percentage, the percentage of dollars that you allocate to each right. position. But the nomination thing, I think, is one thing that uh, is always one of the first questions. Now, we actually, um, I got into a little bit of an argument about this with a couple of the very smart people at Rotoviz that we were doing a mock auction with last year. My take is that no matter what, you want to be nominating, especially on in the earlier rounds, players that other teams are going to want to get. I know some guys, I believe it was actually Josh Hermsmeyer was saying that he likes to nominate kickers and DST right off the bat so he can get that spot filled into his roster. But my thing is, you know you're going to spend $1 on a kicker or DST anyway. Like when you're planning for this draft, you should be doing it backwards. You allocate out the positions you're not going to spend any money on. You know that's going to be a one. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter that you actually have that inked into your roster. What you want to do is get dollars out of the pool and you want to nominate guys that you're not going to go after for a couple of reasons. The biggest one is not only... Is it getting other players to potentially bid up? If you get players that other guys are going to be interested in early on, you can raise the, um, you, you can do some things to kind of manipulate the flow of the draft, especially taking away one player, um, that's important to a tier, if you will, is really going to increase the demand for that player and get more money out of the pool. Um, so I, I think that that's something a lot of people really want to consider. They also like to go ahead and try to get players that they're interested in, uh, but you run the risk of that player getting bid up, especially because people are going to spend more money early on in the in the auction. So I always think if there's a player that you think that you're high on, so like if there's a guy at Rotoviz that we like that other sites aren't touting, you're not going to want to throw him out right away because if somebody starts bidding him up, th there's two things that can happen. Somebody else gets him or you might get him for higher than you were expecting to, whereas if you're thinking that He's not going to be a coveted player. Why not just wait till the end of the draft when you can get him and even it ends up being the same price because other people didn't bid him up. You don't run the risk of, of letting that happen. Yeah, there's so much game theory that goes into it. And it, it makes me think that it's similar in a way uh, to kind of ownership percentages in DFS yeah. in terms of thinking what the like what the herd mentality is going to be. But I think it can go uh, a, a couple of different ways. So I think... If you are with uh, a group of people that's really aggressive, um, then I think it makes a lot of sense to to do what you've talked about. I mean, I think it makes sense to do it anyway. But if you are with uh, some people who are newer to auctions, uh, I think there can also be like the opposite effect where people aren't sure like how much they want to to allocate to different positions. Right. Um, maybe they don't have their their player list tiered. Uh, they just have like a like a cheat sheet and they're mm -hmm. not really thinking about like the stratification of players. Um, so I, I think it's important to test the waters with with players you don't want first. And then once you get a pretty quick sense of the aggressiveness of the other people drafting, then I think you can you can pivot. So I think if they're aggressive, then you keep on nominating players you don't want. If you see that they're tentative, then you try to maybe sneak in a player you do want, but I agree. It probably shouldn't be a player who is flying under the radar. It should mm -hmm. be someone you want who is kind of a, a brand name. Um, yeah. and maybe you can get that player cheaper than you otherwise would have just because the field is a little tentative and kind of feeling its way into the process. Yeah, I, I actually think that that all makes really good sense. And for a guy that hasn't done a lot of auctions, I really think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. So most of what I'm talking about here, uh, I'm, I'm especially focusing on the earlier 
uh, rounds in the auction because I think that's where I see the most mistakes get made. And also, I think that there's a lot of bad auction advice out there because it's not really focusing on, like you said, the game theory. There's a lot of game theory that goes into auctions. And then also, there's some tools out there that are supposed to help people get ready for their auction, but I really think are actually going to make them have a worse auction than they would otherwise. Also, Henry the Cat is back um, messing up the podcast again this week. So <clears throat> we're going to press on. But another question that I get a lot, Matt, too, is can zero running back work in an auction league? So before we get into the major specifics of this, since I know that this is going to be a question that's on people's minds, I'm going to share my roster from last year's uh, Rotoviz auction, and I'm not bringing this up just to show that I killed this auction. I'm bringing it up because even in a Rotoviz league, it's going to show that zero running back was very, very viable. So it was a $200 budget, and I believe that we were going with two running backs, two flex, two wide receiver, one tight end, one quarterback, kicker, DST. Uh, and then I believe the balance was bench. So how many? Yeah, so there was eight, 18, uh, it was 18 man roster. So now keep in mind, this was a Rotoviz league. I still got Keenan Allen, Jarvis Landry, Larry Fitzgerald, Devontae Adams, Michael Crabtree, and Marvin Jones, Cam Newton at quarterback for three bucks. Chris Thompson, I got late for three bucks. Uh, Hunter Henry was my tight end at two bucks. I also had Duke Johnson, Eddie Lacy, Bilal Powell, Frank Gore. Cole Beasley, Giovanni Bernard. Now, my running backs didn't really work out, but I mean, I think for all intents and purposes, that's a pretty solid zero running back type of squad. Yeah, and uh, especially, and I should say, I'm assuming that this was a PPR format. Correct, which yeah. Which makes it a ton of sense, both for zero RB and for the roster that you put together. I, I think that's a, a great roster. Yeah, so I actually believe, I didn't look it up, but according to Devin McIntyre, I ended up with six of the top 15 receivers from going with that configuration. And I yeah. actually think that um, I was able to put together a team in the auction, even against Rotoviz guys going zero running back, that was probably my favorite uh, out of any team that I drafted. Granted, we didn't play the league out, but that just shows you some of the things you can do in an auction. So if you're ready now, Matt, I am going to give some of the notes from my article. So feel free to interject if you think that there's any follow-ups that you have, or if you think that there's natural questions that come off of them. Yeah, that's cool. But I plan on basically saying nothing. I'm just going to put the, the headset down and go like make a sandwich or something. <laughs> <laughs> what type of sandwich would you be making? Uh, I don't know. We'll just have to see what meat is in the refrigerator. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. All right. Let's get back on track here. So the first thing, Matt, that people I think don't pay enough attention to is that auction drafts are not linear. So in your standard snake draft, there's that natural progression, there's that rhythm, and that tends to carry from league to league. So right now, if I ask you to, you know, where Michael Thomas gets drafted, you're going to say, well, it's normally towards the end of the first round, early second round, right? And we know that that's going to happen time and time again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hear you there. Right. But the difference is in an auction, because there is that process of nomination, you have drastic differences that you can see, and you're also going to have it's not that he's getting picked with the 8th, ninth, 10th pick. There's there's those dollars that's going to vary from league to league. So I think one mistake people make is trying to either practice using some type of software that's using very similar values each time, or they're looking at that static set of values that they've generated heading into their auction, but there's a huge problem with this. And ultimately, it comes down to, I always get asked, how do I set my values for an auction? How much should I pay for a guy like Devontae Adams? Is Devontae Adams worth $55? And my answer is, you're not thinking about things correctly, right? Like anything that is offering you values for an auction, you really need to think critically about if it makes sense to use because you are one actor amongst nine or 11 in this auction. And oftentimes we like to bring in financial or economic terms into fantasy football when they don't apply. The auction is one of the few times that they apply because you are in this market with these other actors and you can't set the values because all it takes is one or two guys that are very aggressive in a league to dynamically shift it. Or you show up with a set of values, you print out from some site, 
And there's a couple things missing in that context. Perhaps the values that were generated had fewer players on rosters than what you're using, or the mix of positions was different. And those values have gone out the window. Uh, and I talk about this in one of the articles, which is called Supply, Demand, and Auction Drafts. But essentially, one of the first things that you learn in economics, if you take a class, did you ever take econ, Matt? Yes, I did. You did. So obviously, you know the supply and the demand curve. Uh, yes, but I mean, I took it a long time ago, and I would say I've forgotten a lot. I mean, I remember things, but it's not as if like I would call myself a student of economics. All right. Well, so I'm going to give a quick little rehash here. So basically, there's something that you use in economics to understand pricing and how supply and demand impact it. So we're going to go very simplistic here, but there's supply, which is, we'll call it like the amount of a particular resource. And then there's demand, which is the desire for that particular resource. So they do what's called a uh, supply and demand curve, which is basically, and seeing as we have video for the first time, I'm going to try to put out a video that has this. There's going to be a graphic and I'm also going to do it with my fingers. If you make an X with your fingers, your um, your left finger is going to be the demand curve and your right is the supply curve. And you can see when you shift them, the point where they meet and they make that X, that's supposed to be the equilibrium price, which is a price a product would go with. So you can start to think about this, and we do it in some of the articles that I did on the site, about how demand and supply, well, really to keep it simple, demand is going to shift in your auction given what people do, and that's going to make every auction very unique. And you can have some where the top tier guys are going for like 60 bucks, and others where the top tier guys are going for like 45 So my belabored point here is if you go into an auction with a set of values, a couple things can happen. One is if you have every player in that auction in the top tier priced at the $50 mark, what happens when the other guys in your draft are valuing a lot of these guys at 60 and you end up completely missing on the tier one guys? And then lots of times if the tier one guys are expensive, the tier two guys are going to be expensive. You could completely miss out. Alternatively, if you start thinking that you're getting all of these values because you're getting guys at $55 and you start loading up on them and then you realize that guys of that tier are going later for like $45, you realize that your values you set going into the draft were more or less meaningless. Do you think that that makes sense? Yeah, so there there are so many questions. Uh, I think they're yep. popping up from this, but but uh, one being, uh, so the, one of the situations you just talked about there was, uh, let's say I think you said like you spend fifty three or fifty four, whatever it is, on, on Michael Thomas, and then maybe yep. you see some other players of similar caliber uh, uh, be acquired for uh, fewer dollars in the next couple yeah. of picks. So, yep. what are your thoughts on? Uh, on like nominating, like, do you want to be someone who is a market maker um, and like setting the kind of like the, the benchmark rate or like the anchoring rate for a player within a tier? Or do you want to be someone who slow plays it a little bit and tries to uh, acquire someone maybe in the middle of the tier? Um, yeah. You know, like in that sweet spot, maybe like uh, if you wait too long in that tier, then you end up having to overspend to get the last player available in a tier. So like within yeah. a tier, when are you looking to target certain players? Right. That That's an awesome question, especially because there was one phrase that you used in there to be the maker. And I think it's very dangerous to try to be the person that's setting prices because you don't know what everybody else is thinking. And though we'd like to think that other people are going to make ma- rational, logical choices, that doesn't always happen. So if you're trying to set the price, very often that's not going to happen unless you're the person that is going or willing to spend the most, which I don't think you want to be. So you like to get there in the middle. You see what the pricing for that tier has been established at. And generally, similar players go for around that price. However, you hit upon one thing, which I call the end of tier shift, which is generally what we see is other drafters are aware of the quality of players as well as you are. They know the general perceptions. And if everyone else is seeing that there's one player left in the tier, so maybe there's one tier two running back left, his price is going to rise a little bit because the demand for him goes up, shifts the demand curve to the right, raises that equilibrium price, and then that player is going to go for a little bit more than the players before him went. So generally, the sweet spot, as you said, is right in the middle of the tier. I think it's dangerous to try to be the first one unless there's a player that you absolutely 
want to build into your team no matter what, then you can go for it. But oftentimes, you're best to try to settle down in the middle. All right. Uh, a follow-up question on this. Earlier, sure. you you had noted that, um, you know, whereas most snake drafts, you know, like they're very predictable. You have a very solid sense of the first five players or the first 12 players who are going yep. to be drafted. And it seems as if it might be easy for people in an auction draft to use the uh, the knowledge of snake drafts as something of an anchor. So they yep. might feel as if they should start a, uh, an auction draft by nominating one of the big four running backs or something like that. Yep. Do you find that there uh, are exploitable advantages to to going outside of the like the normal like the top 12 players or the top 24 players uh when you're starting a draft i think that some of that comes down to knowing your league so if i'm in a league that i've been in for 10 years and i i know there's some tendencies where players or drafters might like certain players or there's a certain mold that they're gonna go for if there's a hometown preference then i would throw those out uh when I've been in expert auctions, what I've done, because I don't have that type of information, if there's particular analysts in the league that I know really like players that I'm not planning on going after, that I like other options better in that tier, I will toss those players out. And there are some guys that everybody is planning on going into the auction thinking they're going to get for a value. Those are sweet guys to nominate. Um, at points that might be earlier than they would come up in a snake draft because everybody was thinking to themselves going in, okay, this was a guy that I'm going to try to get. So if you can find those guys, you can actually get them to get bid higher and lose becoming quote unquote a value in the draft or in your auction. All right, good stuff. Move along. <laughs> so this brings me to a really important thing though that I, that I think we need to cover more than anything, right? Which is... There's the supply and the demand. You you recognize that you're not setting the values in your draft. But another thing that permeates into this is this idea of value. And this is one of the things where I don't feel like there's that one from one comparison between what you might have if you're thinking about everything in financial terms. And that is because in fantasy football, you hear so much about value. And I think we do this too much in redraft where we're trying to get good deals, right? Like everything in life, you normally want to get a good deal on. But I think that when you're drafting your team in an auction, you don't want to get overly concerned about value. I'm not saying pay like 10% more for a player um, than analogous players are to him. But if you're going after AJ Green as your first wide receiver and you end up needing to spend an extra three or five dollars, then you feel like you should. That's fine. Make yourself uncomfortable because your dollars are best spent in the beginning of the draft. There's something that I call auction inflation and inflation in economics or finance refers to basically in a simplistic sense, the buying power of your dollar decreasing as the draft goes along, the auction goes along the players start to suck, right? So you want to spend as much money as you can on the good players. So that $3, that $5 is much better to get invested into a player like AJ Green than maybe like a flyer like a Josh Doxson or somebody like that at the end of the draft. So too often what I see is people not wanting to spend an extra 2 or $3 on the high level guys as things move along, they're left with this big budget, but nobody really to spend it on. So you want the majority of your dollars going into the very good players, right? Like you, you, who cares if you're able to outbid people at the end for those lower level players? You want the good players on your team. Yes. Sorry. I had nothing to say there. Yeah, that's fine. I'll just edit that out. Uh, and okay. then the other let me so let me pull up my notes so the, so those are some of the key things um and, and i think it should go without saying right like you don't want to be that person that leaves your draft with money on the table uh, which again brings me to pushing yourself out of your comfort zone early on i think that's the best advice i can give to anybody because you don't want to leave the draft with money on the table and it's best to realize that you could spend too much early, but that's not as much of a mistake as spending too much late. So like the auctions that I've done where I've gotten into trouble have been when I've tilted off of my original plan and I end up, you know, having this surplus of money that I need to spend on running backs that I know I'm probably never going to play. Um, 
Which brings me to a- another point that I wanted to make, Matt, which is we we focused a lot on this show about roster construction and talking about how there's things that you can do to position yourself to have a successful season or increase your probability. So some of that is building in a good balance of upside, getting a little bit of safety where you need it, maybe making a strength in your roster, choosing a weakness. I think that the auction format is one where you're really able to do that, uh, which is why I would caution you against what some of analysts will tell you, which is just go and get your guys. Just get all those guys that you like and that you feel good about. That's a slippery slope to me. You still want to focus, and it's easier to do this than in a snake draft, on putting together a well-balanced roster, uh, anchoring yourself with a particular position, not just getting a mix of guys that you that you like or that can become values, but finding those guys that fit into the broader context of your roster in a way that is that that works, which is why I will try to focus less on saying to myself heading into the draft, like I need to get Tyreek Hill or I need to get Doug Baldwin. Instead, I'll think about the profile that they fit into. And when we reach a point in the draft where a player of that profile is going for a price that seems to make sense, given on what I've seen, I'll go after that profile at that time. So see if there's any other questions that come for, that come to your mind as I as I look through the rest of my notes here. Yeah. One thing that I think is interesting is that, uh, so in, in the draft format, sorry, uh, like snake format, yep. there are some players who will basically never end up on my team. Like regardless of kind of the roster construction I use um, or like when I'm drafting certain positions, some players will just never end up on my team because I don't think that they are values at their ADP. Um, and I think the one thing that is interesting kind of like from a bigger portfolio perspective is that you are much likelier to get in an auction format a lot of the players that you miss in uh, in regular kind of quote unquote like, uh, you know, snake drafts. Yeah. So uh, I think that's something that that is interesting that I hadn't really thought about before. Because like yeah. my, my realistic player pool in uh, in a snake draft like it's not like 150 or 180 players. It is more like, uh, I don't know, probably like 90, maybe even like 70 or 60, just because like at a certain point in the draft, you have your favorites in each round and you can normally get those guys in each round and you just kind of tend to default to them. Yeah. And, And that brings up something too, right? Um, which is why I think when you're planning, and, and there's one key thing that I haven't mentioned here too, which is there is a terminal amount of dollars that are in your auction. So what you'll see happen is, in general, if high tier wide receivers are going for a lot of money, the latter, uh, or like, you know, like once you get to the middle rounds, guys that are maybe tier three fringe tier four wide receivers are going to start to go for cheaper because people have already sunk in significant dollars to their wide receiver position. There is less demand because these drafters in your league have less money. So players are going to go for cheaper. So what you have to remember is that the tier pricing is going to be relative to each other. So if running back early round running backs are going for high dollars in an auction. That means that later on, the running backs are going to go for cheaper. So you got to keep that in mind because that really does open you up to getting these interesting mixes. Normally, you're never going to be able to build your team around tier three wide receivers. In an auction, you really could. You wait till those tier three players start coming up and you just start going after them. But what I like to do when I'm planning for my draft, as I alluded to earlier, and I have percentage breakdowns of of how I've prepared for this in the past, and I have how I allocate my dollars for zero running back up on the site, is I just basically look at that particular league. I see what position I want to build my roster around. I then work backwards and I say, I'm going to put like 1% into kicker, DST, any other position. And then you look at the mix between normally running back and wide receiver, and you say, what percentage am I comfortable spending on a particular position? So for me, for wide receiver, normally it's around like 70 to 75%. And then I'm not focused so much on how I'm going to break down that percentage. Because like I said, in general, the relative pricing of the tiers depends on that auction. And if um, wide receivers are for going for too much earlier, 
I know that they're going to start to come down in the middle rounds and then you could build a team around a really solid group of like tier three or tier four players, or there's all these different mixes that you can do. And I like to workshop out all of these scenarios beforehand so that as things are moving along, I have a plan in place no matter what I'm seeing in those first like 12 picks. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think that's interesting. I think it's important to think of the uh, the the positions that you need not individually, but uh, as a cohort. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's the way to do it. I think that's smart. Yeah, and then the other thing I should point out there too is um, the tiers, when you're thinking about players in tiers, you can't think about them as your personal tiers or your Rotoviz tiers because again, you're not setting the prices. So what I would do is if I know I'm going to be doing an auction on ESPN software, I'll go, I'll look at the average auction, auction prices and get a sense of relative to other players in the same position, what tiers are naturally forming. So I'm not going to be looking at the dollars so much as are there three running backs that are vastly priced higher uh, at their average values than the next set of running backs and look and see how the tiers develop like that. Because oftentimes, just like we see in snake drafts, whatever the experts on that site are saying uh, or the values that they've set, that tends to permeate into the behaviors of everybody that's using these sites software. So you start to get a sense of um, how the tiers are going to develop at that particular site. That's a huge thing that you need to keep in mind. And I actually think that that um, is something that's a little bit exploitive in uh, actual your regular redraft league as well. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um Part, so like your approach to this and knowing that there are people like you who take your auction enthusiasm to this level, that's also part of why I don't play in auction leagues. <laughs> Cause like, I, I, I know I'm just going to lose. Like, I know yeah. I'm drawing dead. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think though, like I said, there's a lot of things that you can exploit and a lot of it. I really think in an auction is not being too rigid. And if you really go into an understanding that you're not setting the prices and that your cheat sheet can be rendered worthless by so many things right off the bat, and you're reacting and you use percentages, you're going to be so much more ahead of the game because a lot of people aren't thinking about the fact that, okay, the implication of early round running backs going for 20 more dollars then early round wide receivers is going to have this downstream effect, which is probably going to be the later round wide receivers are going to be a little bit uh, higher priced relative to the early round wide receivers and the late round running backs are going to be less expensive. There's not a lot of people in your auction that are going to be thinking this through. And uh, so I'd recommend like if you're really focused and you have an auction coming up, go and check out the article that I have, which is supply demand and auction drafts because the visuals will help contextualize this more. And I know I'm losing some context because we're kind of jumping all over the place. And I think I did a better job of laying it out. But um, really, the key points are that you need to recognize that your auction has this very unique supply and demand that's always shifting. It's not linear. So you can't go in with your set list of prices. You've got to make yourself uncomfortable. It's better to spend your dollars early on than later. Uh, There's some things you can do with your nominations. And I did not mention this before, but let someone else drive up the prices. You don't want to be that guy that is sitting there bidding up all like trying to make players go for these expensive prices. There's two reasons for this. One, it only really has downside for you because there's naturally going to be a couple of other people that want to do this anyways. And if you get stuck, you're going to be in a real bad spot. And then the other thing that can happen is you start bidding up people. They want to do the same to you. So again, we get back to some of that game theory there. Uh, Look at your roster as percentages, allocate a percentage of whatever the budget is to each particular position, fill that as it goes along and recognizing that there's probably going to be opposite relationships of the early tier players at a position and the later tier players. And uh, you got to remember the end of tier shift and really get yourself familiar with the site that you're at, how the auction tiers are going to form. Any follow-ups, Matt? Uh, no, that was very informative and uh, more than I ever wanted to know about auction strategy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, hey, here's the thing. Like I said, I think that actually covers just about all of the content from my most popular article out there. So everybody do me a solid because I basically just gave you my most popular article for free, which is follow me on Twitter. This is the one time I'm ever going to go this this route because I think it's silly, but I do think that um, you're kind of... I don't know how to say this, Matt, but basically, like, regardless of how good of an analyst you might be, 
uh, it plays into people's perception how many follows followers you have on Twitter. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. So, so give like, me a follow for like, that. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm, I'm a trash analyst, but I have a decent Twitter <laughs> following just because I've been around long enough. Uh, even though I, even though I suck at Twitter, like I'm, I'm the worst on Twitter. Like I just, yeah. I'm so lazy. I, I don't want to tweet things. Thank you for listening to Rotoviz Radio. Please rate, review, and contact us via email at rotovizradio at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at Rotoviz Radio and support the pod by subscribing to Rotoviz at a 30% discount through the listener homepage at rotoviz.com forward slash podcast. Yeah.